Jill Valentine is one of the main protagonists of the Resident Evil series, having the second highest amount of playable appearances in mainline games behind Chris Redfield. Jill represents a lot of firsts for the Versus series. She was the first character from Resident Evil to appear in the Versus games. Alongside fellow Marvel vs. Capcom 2 newcomers Hayato, Tron Bond, and Servbot, she's also among the first Capcom roster inclusions to originate from a 3D console title. Jill is also the first character in the series to originate from a game series typically rated M for Mature by the ESRB. Jill's first and arguably most memorable appearance in the series was in 2000's Marvel vs. Capcom 2, New Age of Heroes, which debuted in arcades on Sega's Naomi hardware and received an arcade perfect port to the Sega Dreamcast the same year. Jill's character design and moveset in Marvel 2 are largely inspired by her appearance in the original 1996 Resident Evil. While some of her moveset is indeed made up for this game, a surprisingly large chunk of it is inspired by her home series. She's voiced by Katherine Disher, who's done a good bit of live action in VA roles, but most relevantly provided the voice of Jean Grey and Dazzler in X-Men the Animated Series. She went on to provide the voice of Storm, Psylocke, and Spyro in Capcom's Marvel Fighters, and eventually the Versus games, before landing the role of Jill Valentine in Resident Evil 3 Nemesis, released just one year prior to Marvel vs. Capcom 2 for the Sony PlayStation. Marvel vs. Capcom 2 has both Japanese and localized names for most of the attacks, with the localized names in particular coming from the 2009 re-release on PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360. For the sake of simplicity, we'll be using the localized names here when possible. First off, we have Charging Stars, Jill's quarter circle forward and punch attack. The name seems to be a clever Resident Evil themed play on Captain America's Charging Star attack, which functions similarly. The heavy version of this can be charged by holding heavy punch and used once you let go, while the light version can be comboed into. Next up is Jill's counter, Return Fire, which is done by doing a half circle back and punch motion. Jill will take a defensive stance and flash for a brief bit of time. If she's attacked during this period, Jill will shove the attacker forward and fire off shots from her gun. The amount of shots she does in retaliation can be increased by mashing a punch button. While this attack isn't based on a specific ability in Resident Evil, it does seem to be a pretty overt reference to a very common enemy interaction within the early Resident Evil games, shoving a zombie off of you and unloading a clip into it in retaliation. Next up is the Grenade Launcher, which is done with the Dragon Punch motion combined with any punch. Jill also has the ability to delay the explosion of the round she fires by holding the punch button. This is the very same one she uses in Resident Evil 1, though it's called a bazooka there. Next up is Zombie Escape, which is done with a quarter circle back and kick motion. The light version of this attack summons a zombie from Jill's side of the screen. When the zombie gets close enough, it'll grab the opponent and attack them several times, opening them up for a combo. This zombie is slow, but unblockable. Jill can also attack the zombie to force them onto the ground. If your opponent goes near them, the zombie will grab and gnaw at their leg. These are of course identical to the ways zombies can attack you in the Resident Evil games. The heavy kick variation of this summons a flaming zombie, which explodes on contact instead of grabbing your opponent. They can't be tripped up by Jill, but are unblockable though. Cerberus Escape is done with a quarter circle forward motion and light kick, and summons a zombie dog that runs along the bottom of the screen very similarly to the tigers that Strider can summon. These dogs can be found all throughout Resident Evil 1, but are probably best remembered for their window jump scare in the first floor east wing hallway in the mansion. Crow Escape is the quarter circle forward heavy kick attack, which has a crow swoop in from the top of the screen and dive in a low arcing pattern. Like the Cerberus, crows are in multiple places in RE1, but the place that always comes to mind for me when thinking about them is the room where you find Forrest's body in the bazooka. Staying in one place for too long in that room has the crows peck you to death. Jill's forward and back throw has her leap onto her opponent and slash him with a knife before leaping off. The knife is a staple in any Resident Evil game and the first one is no different. Jill also has a slide command normal done by pressing down and heavy kick. Jill's first hyper combo is hypercharging stars, again a take on Captain America's hypercharging star. This is done by doing a quarter circle forward motion and pressing the two punch buttons. If incorporating this move into an air combo, it can be comboed into from the light version of Charging Stars, but be aware that unless you're in the corner, it'll only connect if cancelled from the first hit of standard Charging Stars. 
doing a quarter circle forward motion in two kicks has Jill pull out a rocket launcher, which has her fire out, predictably, a bunch of rockets from a distance. This rocket launcher is the same one that can be unlocked by beating RE1 in a certain amount of time, as well as giving the Jill in the game's final boss fight by Brad Vickers to combat the tyrant. Speaking of, doing a quarter circle back motion in two kicks initiates Jill's third hyper combo, Code T002. Jill lights a flare, only to have the tyrant pop up from underground and slash the opponent continuously until leaving. Like the aforementioned rocket launcher, this is directly referencing how the final boss fight in Resident Evil 1 begins. The references don't stop there, though. If Jill wants to spend another bar of super for more damage, input a quarter circle forward motion and a kick as the tyrant poses after its final slash. Jill will pull out the rocket launcher and fire a single rocket at the tyrant, destroying it and causing the enemy extra damage from the resulting explosion. This is once again a reference to how Jill finishes off the Tyrant at the end of the first Resident Evil game. Like every character in Marvel vs. Capcom 2, Jill has three selectable assists. Her first assist is her most unique, her heal assist. Jill pulls out a green herb and holds it out for a few seconds. If you're able to get your point character to her and have them touch the herb, they'll be healed. Sometimes she'll pull out a set of mixed green and red herbs, but they heal for the same amount. The herbs are of course the main method of healing in Resident Evil games, with the ECG monitor from the early games even showing up here as well. Her second assist is her Charging Stars attack. Her final assist is her Grenade Launcher Anti-Air. Here are Jill's alternate color schemes. And here are her wind poses. Jill's intro animations also contain Resident Evil shoutouts. Her pre-fight animation will see her tossing around either an ink ribbon used to save your game in the Resident Evil series, or a small key. Interestingly enough, Jill doesn't actually use small keys in Resident Evil 1 as she can lockpick any door that needs them, whereas Chris needs to rely on them. Jill's next appearance in the series would be in Marvel vs. Capcom 2's direct sequel, 2011's Marvel vs. Capcom 3 Fate of Two Worlds, for the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3. Jill's inclusion here is notable for a few reasons. For one, she wasn't initially intended to make the roster. She was added in to balance out the roster count after Capcom managed to convince Marvel, after a lot of prodding, to allow them to add Shuma Gorath to the roster, though Marvel added the stipulation that Shuma only be added as DLC, which likely informed Jill's inclusion as such as well. Jill and Shuma are also the first full purchasable DLC characters to ever be released for a Capcom fighting game. Going back to Jill specifically though, Jill is one of a handful of characters throughout the entire Versus series, Marvel, Tatsunoko, or otherwise, to be completely redesigned from the ground up, both in terms of character design and moveset design, joining the likes of Roll, who received a similar revamp between her appearance in Marvel vs. Capcom 2 and Tatsunoko vs. Capcom. These two characters would later be joined by Frank West, who got a revamp between Tatsunoko vs. Capcom Ultimate R-Stars and Ultimate Marvel vs. Capcom 3, and Thanos, who would be revamped from Marvel vs. Capcom 2 to 2017's Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite. Jill in Marvel vs. Capcom 3 is based entirely on her appearance in Resident Evil 5, which was at the time the most recent mainline Resident Evil game, and Jill's most recent appearance overall. She specifically still seems to be under Wesker's control as she was in Resident Evil 5, and this informs her dialogue with other characters as well as her moveset. Jill is voiced by Kari Walgren in English in Marvel vs. Capcom 3, while she's voiced by Atuko Yuya in Japanese. This is actually somewhat notable, as it marks the first time she, as well as her other Resident Evil castmates that appear in Marvel 3, have had a Japanese voice actor, as the Resident Evil games previously maintained an English-only voice track for Resident Evil games released in all other regions outside of the US. While Marvel 2 didn't have any character themes, Marvel 3 brings them back for each and every character, Jill included. Jill's theme in 3 is a remix of Sad But True, the theme that plays during the boss fight against her in Resident Evil 5. 
He's the original as it sounds in Resident Evil 5. And here's the Marvel vs. Capcom 3 remix. In addition to her special moves and throws, I'm also going to highlight a normal tool as well, since a lot of her moveset recreates animations directly from Resident Evil 5. We'll start off with her launcher, which is based off of her sweep kick from Resident Evil 5. Next is her Standing Heavy, which is a Resident Evil 5 roundhouse kick. Holding back and pressing Heavy Punch gives you her Reverse Roundhouse, which you got from shooting an enemy in the arm, then attacking from behind in Resident Evil 5. Holding forward and pressing Heavy has Jill do Sickle Kick. More on this in a second. Jill's throw is her net grab from Resident Evil 5, which you got from shooting an enemy in the knee and then initiating melee from behind. Jill's core to circle forward in light attack is her flip kick. This is taken from the move of the same name in Resident Evil 5, though it's quite rare and can only be done in co-op. Similarly, Jill's core to circle forward in medium attack is cartwheel kick, again taken from Resident Evil 5 and like Flip Kick is strictly a co-op maneuver in Resident Evil 5. Jill's quarter circle forward and heavy attack is Arrow Kick. This one is taken directly from the cutscene preceding the 2 on 2 fight against Wesker and herself in Resident Evil 5. Sickle Kick, Flip Kick, and Cartwheel Kick leave Jill in a crouching stance that allows her to dash forwards, backwards, or upwards by inputting the desired direction. Jill can also go into this feral crouch stance by inputting down twice and pressing the special button. She can also cancel this stance and return to a neutral position by pressing the special button once more while in feral crouch mode. Jill also has unique actions outside of the command dash that can be done in her feral crouch stance. Pressing light attack has Jill do a low sweep. This one's interesting because unlike her other actions in Feral Crouch, this one doesn't cancel the stance at the end of the attack. Pressing medium attack has Jill perform Jumping Roundhouse, which wall bounces. This attack seems to be more or less based on this cutscene directly preceding Jill's boss fight in Resident Evil 5. Pressing heavy gives you her somersault attack. This attack can be jump cancelled and used to extend ground combos for Jill. Quarter circle forward in either light, medium, or heavy in the air gives you double knee drop. This is one of Jill's signature melee moves in Resident Evil 5, most commonly seen in Mercenaries mode. The medium and heavy versions will ground bounce against airborne enemies. Doing a dragon punch motion and light attack gives you fallen prey. This attack is a sweep that can hit off the ground, or OTG as it's more commonly abbreviated, and works as a grounded combo ender after an air combo. Dragon Punch and Medium Attack is Ensnarement. This attack is directly lifted from, you guessed it, a Resident Evil 5 cutscene. Dragon Punch and Heavy is Position Change. This is a side switch command grab that's somewhat similar to the one Yoon has in Street Fighter. Jill's first hyper combo is Machine Gun Spray. This is Invincible and is an OTG. This one seems loosely based on one of her attacks in her RE5 boss battle. Next up is Raven Spike. 
This one slots a lot neater in the Jill's bread and butter combos thanks to the way that damage is scaled during it. Jill's level 3 hyper combo is her most notable, Mad Beast, done with a quarter circle back motion and two attack buttons. This is an install super that places her in an extended feral crouch for its duration on top of some new benefits. All normals and specials are cancelable into her teleport. Her teleport becomes special cancelable and she can use teleports in the air as well. This is by far the most complex install super in the game, if not the series as a whole, and making the most of it demands a high level of execution. Next up are Jill's assists. Her first assist is Cartwheel Kick. Her second assist is Arrow Kick. And her final assist is Somersault. Next up are Jill's colors. First is her standard outfit, again based off of her Resident Evil 5 appearance. She still has Wesker's control device on her chest, indicating that she's still under his control, though she does seem to show that she's broken free from it in some specific win quotes. More on that in a second. Jill's Player 2 costume is a shout out to Saki from Quiz Nanairo Dreams. She was an assist character in Marvel vs. Capcom 1 before becoming an unlockable playable character in the Wii port of Tatsunoko vs. Capcom, first generation of heroes, and becoming a base roster character in the game's 2010 update, Ultimate All-Stars. Jill's third outfit is inspired by Vanessa's Intera Fusion suit from PNO3 on the GameCube. Jill's fourth outfit is dark green, to color coordinate with Wesker and Nemesis, who also have dark green outfits. Jill's fifth outfit is pink, to go in line with the many characters in the game with pink outfits, though her hair color was changed to help differentiate it from the Saki color. Jill's sixth outfit is based on the color scheme of Vanessa's default outfit from PNO3. And finally, Jill's alternate costume is her iconic tube top and skirt combo from Resident Evil 3 Nemesis. She still has Wesker's mind control device though. Here's all of her special intro and outro dialogue against specific characters. Enemies will be destroyed. Something's come up. Got to go. Get ready. You're expendable, Chris Redfield. Death shall be your reward. If you are ready to administer drugs to captive, ready to seize mutant targets. Now you encounter real power. Mutant taken into custody. Nemesis has been spotted. Go for broke! Target is down. Administering sedative. Hyper combo KO! You win! This will only hurt a little. Ready for training. Let's see how good you really are. Ready? My training's complete. Jill's ending in both Marvel vs. Capcom 3 and Ultimate Marvel vs. Capcom 3 are largely identical visually though the dialogue differs between the two. Here's our ending from Fate of Two Worlds.
And here's the updated ending from Ultimate Marvel vs. Capcom 3. And that's all she wrote for Ms. Valentine. I think Jill occupies a pretty unique spot in the Capcom vs. games. She's arguably the character that changed the most between any two given entries, and she kind of depicts the growth and evolution of the Resident Evil brand between the 11 years that took place between Marvel 2 and Marvel 3's release. I myself prefer her Marvel vs. Capcom 2 incarnation, but appreciate how intricately designed her Marvel vs. Capcom 3 version is with a skill ceiling that arguably rises above most of the characters in the game. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.